talk to you about an expedition uh, to Papua New Guinea that I undertook uh, last year, and the story is going to be about spiders. Uh, if you were to look underneath your seat right now, chances are you would not find anything particularly new. Uh, uh, most of what you would find would be things that are forgotten. They'd be bits of paper, they'd be old pins, they'd be a bit of dust that came in when somebody walked in. And those of us that live in cities are used to most of the world being fully explored, most of the world that we see being known, maybe bits forgotten, maybe bits uh, uh, neglected, but nothing particularly mysterious or new, at least at the range that our eyes can see. But if you were to stand or sit on a log in Papua New Guinea in a rainforest in the mountains, and you look down, chance would be very good that the next insect or spider that walked by would be a species that was new to science. Uh, and tonight, I want to talk about this wonderful, magical place uh, of Papua New Guinea and some of the things that we found. The expedition took place in July of 2008, uh, uh, sponsored by and organized by the Con Conservation International. Um, uh, it was one of their RAP biodiversity surveys, Rapid Assessment Program, where they go in and try to understand what biodiversity is present in an area across a spectrum of different groups of organisms, uh, partly to discover new things, but partly to assess uh, uh, what diversity is there among known organisms too. Uh, they do these programs all over the world. Uh, the one I went to uh, was Papua New Guinea. The group of people that went, the participants, uh, are shown here. The main group of people that went from site to site, uh, they hail from the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., South Australian Museum, myself, people from Papua New Guinea, graduate students in various places in the U.S., uh, and so forth. And you'll see in the little icons at the bottom here the different groups of organisms that people worked on, uh, a couple of mammologists, uh, a couple of ornithologists, a couple of botanists, um, one person who's a herpetologist, and myself who works on spiders. So where is Papua New Guinea? Here we are in Vancouver. We can fly over with Google Earth across the Pacific, across uh, uh, past Hawaii, down towards Australia, and we'll find Papua New Guinea uh, north of Australia, one of the world's larger islands. The eastern half is the country of Papua New Guinea. The western half belongs to Indonesia. Uh, the main sites that, we, that I went to were five, and they're shown with these blue dots. It turns out, though, that a number of these sites were side trips that I took on my own uh, for various reasons. And the main target of the expedition was this big blue dot at the left, at the west, Wanakipa. And so what I'm going to do with the first part of the talk is tell you about the most heart-pounding, adrenaline-pumping moment for me. Uh, and it's just going to be a story to get you there, and so we're going to start this story uh, at the capital city, Port Moresby, uh, uh, where we collected as a group uh, and took off uh, via a reasonably large plane uh, to Mount Hagen. Uh, from there, in a twin otter, a smaller prop plane, to uh, uh, Porgara, and you can see Porgara here uh, in, a, in a circle here. Let me show it to you that way. Uh, and then we eventually took another twin otter to an airstrip at Wanakipa. And the airstrip at Wanakipa uh, was simply a grass field. Before I go on and tell you exactly where we went, who we were with, uh, I want to just mention that Papua New Guinea is an amazing place in terms of cultural diversity and human diversity. Papua New Guinea has been inhabited by humans for at least 50,000 years. Uh, there are over 800 languages that are still remaining. Um, many of the languages are spoken in only very small areas. Here is a map of one section of Papua New Guinea. You can see at lower left a scale each block being 10 kilometers. Some of these languages are only spoken in a little 10 by 10 kilometer area. Um, in large part, you can think of Papua New Guinea not even so much as, uh, it's almost more like the European Union, but, but it's almost a, a, a 800 nations because each of these language groups is a group of people that are largely autonomous from the central government in many ways. And if you do anything in Papua New Guinea, there's almost no government on the land, basically. If you do anything in Papua New Guinea, you have to get the permission and arrangements of the local people. Uh, it, it's got a reputation for having a lot of wars going on and so forth, but the way I look at it, it's not really very much different from what Europe tended to have been like up until uh, relatively recent in human history. So it's just a lot of little nations almost packed into a small space. Um, there is a common lingua franca that, that most uh, people that we met uh, spoke, and it's a relatively recently derived language. Uh, it's sometimes called Pidgin English, uh, a, a word that's a name that people tend to prefer nowadays is Talpissan. It was derived from a blend of English, German, and local languages. 
Uh, you can see here on the back of this airplane seat uh, the word tambu, which is tabu, true, which is true or very, long, uh, something. Uh, the word dispella means this fellow, which it basically means this. Uh, and a couple of other words from other languages, Rausen is from the Parauts, German, meaning out of, and, uh, uh, and then Balas, I don't know what language it comes from, means airplane. So, uh, Tulkpissen is spoken uh, by most people. It's relatively easy to learn. I never really learned it except for little bits and pieces. But, there, but where I was, most people could at least help translate through to English. So the area we went in particular was the big uh, purple dot on the bottom, the, the land of the Hewa. Uh, here uh, is uh, a group of Hewa uh, greeting us uh, as we arrived. Um, they are, uh, this is in the, on the airstrip. The, most of the families live more or less scattered through the forest in, in family plots, but the, the, there is somewhat of accumulation, uh, not really quite a village at the airstrip. So um, there is a, a cross-section of some of the Hewa. They, the Hewa uh, make a living primarily as subsistence uh, farmers, uh, sweet potatoes, peanuts, um, uh, bananas, uh, a few other things, as well as hunters. And the reason that we chose this particular site was primarily because of the groundwork laid by Bill Thomas, shown here at left. He's an anthropologist that has been working with the Hewa for quite a while. The Hewa were uh, uh, contacted by the Western world relatively late uh, compared to other groups in Papua New Guinea because their area is inaccessible by land, except if you want to walk for a week, uh, uh, and inaccessible uh, by water. So uh, it took, I believe, until the 1970s until there was sort of any sort of consistent contact. And he's been uh, working with them. He has this program where he gives them all digital cameras, teaches them how to use it, and then he basically lets them document themselves uh, and comes and talks to them. He spends a while every summer there. But he also has this program uh, where he wants to try to encourage a stewardship of the forest uh, by the Hewa um, by linking them with biologists uh, coming from the outside. The notion being that the Hewa have some need for, uh, uh, for um, uh, money, not a whole lot, but some need for money, uh, and so if we come in and pay them to help us and so forth, that might uh, uh, lead them to orient some of their efforts towards taking care of the forest so that it can continue to be a good place for biologists to come in. Not so much ecotourism, but, but uh, something along those lines. Uh, the two <coughs> uh, with, which, uh, with, which with whom I work the most uh, were Fimo on the left, a, a great garrulous guy that uh, was just a really good companion in the field, and Island on the right, uh, I think of him as the professor. He, he, he had this sort of wisdom and uh, serenity. He, he, I thought of him as a professor. He knew everything about the forest. He was just an incredible guy. So they helped me uh, uh, collect spiders. 